We, uh, if the format holds true for this session, we are responding to the two presentations. Um, and let me just uh, begin with uh, two responses. One to Dr. Charles Raven's uh, presentation. I could not help but think that uh, in college, I, was, I read uh, Hegel right before I read Kierkegaard. And I was more thankful than ever for the conversion that Soren Kierkegaard brought into my life on that occasion. And uh, it was intriguing to be caught within that Hegelian haze, which uh, for me was read around the same time that, uh, that Jimi Hendrix was singing about purple haze. <laughs> The, the, other, the other thing that came into my mind is uh, in, in uh, the, the convergence of the two presentations was it seemed to me that uh, in reflecting upon what Dr. Raven had said and, and what Bishop M Michael Nazarelli had said is that there was, there is uh, a methodology in Rowan Williams that is so culturally uh, contextualized and conditioned that it is unable to work within the larger Anglican communion. It might have actually worked if it was only uh, focused towards Western civilization because we are so immured in that. But it's too culturally conditioned. That's just from the level of pragmatism not from the level of truth. Um, but with that, I'm just going to turn it over to, why don't we begin first with uh, Canon Harmon and some thoughts upon uh, the presentations. All right. Good morning. OK. I uh, just want to say one thing in response to Charles, and then uh, the rest will be a response to Michael, but really the whole conference. As somebody who studied with Rowan Williams, uh, Charles has my utmost sympathy. I think he's extremely difficult to understand. But I think one of the best ways uh, to summarize the difficulties is, of all things, what Hannah Arendt said about Paul Tillich's theology, which was, there must be something wrong with Tillich's theology because when I read it, I can't pray it. I mean, the, the, the comment about the absence of scripture, it's deeper than that. It's, you are not encouraged and nourished to pray and to understand your faith better as a result of that theology, in addition to its, its desperate lack of, of real engagement with the text of Scripture. Uh, something about that isn't right. You can't pray Rowan Williams' theology. You really can't. I, I defy you to try. My interest is especially in the title of the conference, which I uh, wrote down again, uh, Recovering the Power of the Word of God. And it's there that I want to focus my thoughts. Just a few quick things. I'm trying to lace together things all the way through the conference that are common themes as a way to kind of encourage us as we're sent out. One is what the Bible is. We had a great testimony from one of our brothers about letters from his then girlfriend, now wife, over a period of time. And it brought to mind Austin Ferrer's comment about the Bible, which I wanted to read to you, not just because he was one of the great Anglicans in our tradition, but because he has a beautiful way of putting how Christians are to think of the Bible. And, I, and there's hardly anything more important when you open the Bible than to think about how you think about what you're doing. And, and here's Ferrer's comment. He says this, he says, what is the Bible like? He says, like a letter which a soldier wrote to his wife about the disposition of his affairs and the care of his children, in case he should chance to be killed. And the next day he was shot and died, and the letter was torn and stained with his blood. Her friends said to the woman, the letter is of no binding force, it is not a legal will, and is so injured by the facts of the writer's own death that you cannot ever prove what it means. But the lady said, I know the man, and I am satisfied I can see what he means, and I shall do it because it is what he wanted me to do and because he died the next day. That is what it means to read the Bible. It means to read a personal letter from God stained with his own blood. If you start there, you can hardly do better. Secondly, 
This was implicit in what Billy Shand shared last night about fits. The central mode in the interpretation of the Bible in the hearer is an indispensable part of our tradition. Billy Shand, in his story about Fitz, said that when Fitz read Romans 8, and when he went into the parking lot and spoke to a mutual friend, he was blown away by the way that Romans 8 was read. And the woman said, well, you know, he read it that way because he really believed it. In 1 Thessalonians, Paul says that in his ministry, when he came to Thessalonica, his word came to them, not in word only, but in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. 1 Thessalonians 1.5. And when I was a young Christian, I always thought that that passage meant conviction in the hearers. After all, it's the Holy Spirit's role to convict you when you hear something, to convict you of the truth of it. And I was completely blown away when I got to, to, to look at the text and really play with it in the original language to realize that it's not conviction to the hearers. That's not what it's talking about. The conviction in 1 Thessalonians 1 is the conviction of the speaker. One of the central ways in which the Bible works in the, in, in, with power in the church is when the Bible convinces you of its own truth and you, then you speak as a convicted person under the authority of the word which has grabbed hold of you to others. There's something mysterious about it, but there's a tremendous power in it. When you hear a sermon from someone who has heard from God through the word, it touches you. And uh, I, I can think of no better witness to that than the story that Billy Shan said about Fitz. I mean, w wouldn't that be a great thing to have anybody say about you? They preached that sermon as if he really believed it. Imagine. <laughs> Third, thirdly, uh, there's been implicit in this conference, and I wanted to bring this out, the proper heart attitude that we need to have uh, with regard to scripture. It was there, especially in, in Bill Dixon's talk, but it's been there all the way through. Uh, Bishop Nazar Ali has this all the time. The, the Hebrew idea is to delight. It, 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 it isn't something that's just to be heard and, and understood as a letter that comes with authority, but it's a source of joy and delight and playfulness. One of my friends spent his whole life with me in ministry because I lack a sense of humor sometimes, I know that's not unique to me, sending me New Yorker cartoons. And one of my all-time favorites is, and this is ironic given the connection with Alan Bloom that Stephen Knoll has, uh, The Closing of the American Mind. And it's a bookstore and, the, and the, it's the book manager behind the desk and there's a person and there's the, on the bookstore stand right at the central place of the cash register is The Closing of the American Mind and the caption is with this very eager customer looking at the Salesman, he says, I haven't read it, but it's a great book. <laughs> Here's an interesting question for you. Uh, if you ever think about it in somebody's ministry, what's the best talk they've ever given? One of the pe things I ask people is, what's the best talk so-and-so has ever given? What, what made the most impression on you? And one of my friends, of all the talks that Fitz Allison has given, this was the one that meant the most to him. And I've, I sadly have never heard this, so I've only heard it related to me several times secondhand. Fitz gives a talk about falling in love with the New Testament. My friend actually went to a conference with clergy where Fitz talked about learning to love the New Testament, to go to bed with it, to get up with it, to talk about it with your friends, to think about it when you're walking along the way. It sounds like Deuteronomy to me. But there's, a, there's an inward delight. You know, love, love letters aren't just things you read. They're things you play with and, and think about and, and uh, taste and touch. And, and see and feel and all those great things. Fourthly, and this was very clearly mentioned in, in Bill Dixon's talk, and I'm gonna get in trouble for this, uh, but I wanna say it absolutely emphatically. In order to really understand the Bible and for the Bible to have power, it has to be studied in its original languages. Let me say that again. In order to really understand the Bible and let it speak with authority and power. It has to be studied in its original languages. Now I'll let you in on a dirty little secret. There's 11 accredited to seminaries in the Episcopal Church. There's only one until recently where you had even had to have one year in biblical languages. It's pathetic. Where I went to seminary at Regent College for uh, two years, three years of biblical languages was required. More than three years was encouraged. You could not graduate from Regent College without two years of Hebrew or two years of Greek and one year of Hebrew or one year of Greek to start. If you want a great article, find this article on the web. I'd love to quote for it from it, but I don't have time. You heard Robert Monday, of all things, how's about this? The dean of an Anglo-Catholic seminary 
referring to a Baptist preacher as one of his heroes. I love it. John Piper, one of the great ministers in America today, and one, by the way, one of the great preachers. Piper has a great article. Here's the title, Brothers, Bitzer Was a Banker. The article is about a banker in a congregation who wrote a devotional of Greek and Hebrew passages from scripture, which is a daily devotion. And, and Piper's point is, lay people in good parishes know Greek and Hebrew. We, we don't even think about thinking that way in the Episcopal Church. And the thing is, it, if you read the Bible in the original languages, it's like looking at a photo uh, that, that's on a slide presentation and that's out of focus. I mean, you can see the broad outlines and the relationships, but all of a sudden when you turn the lens, it's all different. The colors, the contrasts, the subtleties, the nuances, it, it, it's all there. And uh, only, I think, a reformation will come uh, when we learn to rediscover the importance of reading the Bible in the original languages. And the last thing I want to say is this, the absolutely pivotal role of preaching. Sometimes when I attend a conference, I ask myself, which, which talk was the most important? And I'm sorry to burst other bubbles, but for me, the most important talk at this conference was Gillis, Har Gillis Harp's talk. Because the pew never rises higher than the pulpit, and there will never be a recovery of the Word of God without a recovery of the importance in the ministry of preaching. And I, I, I love to fancy myself thinking about what Simeon would say to a conference like this. But I hope you heard what Gillis Harp said about this guy. 54 years in one pulpit literally changed the course of the Church of England. One church historian said, had the influence of two popes, not one, but two popes, a parish priest. He taught himself how to preach. The, the, the lamentable state of preaching in the Church of England in the 18th century when he started was so pathetic, he, couldn't, he not only didn't know how to preach, he couldn't find anything to help him figure out how to preach. And he had to find a French book by Claude called Essays on the Composition of a Sermon, which is when he started. He was a pathetic preacher when he started. And what did Simeon find? Basically this, <laughs> sermons have to be biblical, they have to be organized, and they have to tie what the Bible says to the life of the hearers. If they don't do those three things, they don't get out of the starting blocks of being a sermon. Guess what, brothers and sisters? 90% of the sermons I hear in the Episcopal Church never get out of the starting blocks on the racetrack. We are one of the worst preaching churches in Christendom. And we must learn to recover the priority of, the importance of, the devotion to, and the critical uh, role of preaching. A revival of preaching will help us revive the Word of God. Bishop Nasr Ali said, confidence. <laughs> confidence. Confidence comes from preachers who proclaim the Word with confidence because they've confidently heard the Word first. Thank you. Thank you, Kendall. Dr. Eck, you want me to go to Dr. Edith Humphrey first? Would you mind? I don't think I'm on, though. Hello? Hello? There we go. Oh, my goodness. Can I have yours? Yes. I don't know if it's on it. I'll hold it down for you. How's that? Oh, it's all right. I just don't want to eat the microphone. It looks like it has to be very close and deep. Um, thank you for, um, uh, for the wonderful <coughs> pleasure of being here among old and new friends. I'm really, I really enjoyed the last two weeks marvelously and uh, the last two days, and um, especially I've enjoyed the last two papers. Um, I uh, could have uh, sat and listened to an exposition of um, the theology and the presuppositions of um, the Archbishop for a very long time, and I want to thank uh, Dr. Raven for his work there, and also thank you very much, Bishop Nasser Ali, for, uh, the, for the words that you've given to us. I think we could spend uh, an entire, um, an entire uh, session on, on all of these things. Um, I, I wanted to begin by responding a little bit to, um, to some of the things that uh, Dr. Raven said, particularly with regards to the playing off of the cataphatic and the apophatic tradition, which is seen more in a more vulgar way in many of um, the uh, contemporary revisionist theologians, but much more subtly, I think, in, um, in uh, Archbishop uh, Rowan Williams' work. And, and I think that, uh, that it's the subtle of, of, um, of uh, Dr. Williams' work that makes it difficult for us to pick up immediately on what's going on there. 
Um, I, I would just want to say it, it, it would be very helpful for some to go back and to read the people that have, uh, of, of whom uh, Williams is so enamored, people like Pseudo Dionysius and, um, and for example, the, the more modern Vladimir Lasky, and to look at what they actually say about apophatic theology and what they actually say about the importance of cataphatic theo theology as the foundation for our understanding of God. Uh, Lasky writes, for example, to the economy in which God reveals himself in creating the world and in becoming incarnate. And how do we know about the incarnation except through the word? To that, we must respond by theology. Confessing the transcendent nature of the Trinity. Did you hear it? Confessing the transcendent nature of the uh, Trinity. And then he goes on to say, in an ascent of thought which recessively has an apophat uh, apophatic thrust. In other words, we begin with theology, and as we come to know God more and more, it very well become true that our mouths will be stopped, as was the mouth of Job, in, 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 in the presence of the Lord, and we just worship. But we don't begin there. We begin by hearing the words. And, and Orthodox theology has never left behind the cataphatic, nor would it play off these two very important things, uh, two very important uh, elements and approaches to theology. And um, that's true also of Pseudo Dionysius. If we actually look at his work, he insists upon the importance of those things that can be said about God, as well as saying that there is that which is um, uh, which is involved in knowing God that goes beyond speech. That's true whenever we meet any person and how much more uh, the divine person. Um, and, and so um, I, I remember when I was doing study in my study of, um, of uh, Gregory of Nyssa, who has a lot to say about um, the importance of uh, apophatic uh, responses to God. He never compartmentalized his life. He was very, uh, very involved in the whole struggle against, um, uh, against heresy in his day and made very many um, uh, careful creedal statements and helped to form many of the things that we say today and that we take for granted in the church. Nevertheless, he also talked about the way of darkness and the two are not to be played off one against the other. So I, I think that, that, that what we have um, uh, with, uh, uh, with Archbishop Rowan's work is unfortunately a very subtle slide towards giving complete primacy to the apophatic. And, and it, it can't bear that weight, nor was it ever meant to do that. That's a goal, to come into God's presence and to be, and to be, um, to be stunned and to be lost in wonder, love, and praise, to use the hymn. But, but we begin by knowing who God is. Uh, uh, mm. Excuse me, please. Sure. But in my house, I've got 15 dictionaries, and not, not, none of them define apophatic. There may be some here. Sure. Thank you. I'm sorry. My, deep, my deepest apologies. Uh, uh, both of, uh, okay, spelling, A-P-O. P H A T I C, and the other is cataphatic, K A T A, sometimes spelt with a C, but I think inaccurately there, K A T A P H A T I C. And the phatic part of those two words comes from the Greek verb phami, I speak. So if something is cataphatic, it's according to speech, right? Our creeds are according to speech. Uh, the scriptures are according to speech, though they talk about other things that we cannot put entirely in propositional language. Our hymns are according to speech. The apophatic is when you put speech aside. And, and the, the, the term is used um, in order to, 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 to say truly that God is beyond our speech, but not less than our speech. God did, obviously doesn't despise proposition because he became the one who was the word. God the Son was incarnate as the Word speaking to us. But there are, there are more things to know about Jesus and about his love for us and about our life than can be put precisely in language. And that's what the apophatic is all about. But the two aren't to be seen as in a collision course, if you like. Um, the other thing that I found absolutely fascinating, and, and thank you for calling attention to this, uh, Dr. Raven, was the, the business of, um, of Williams' um, 
uh, depicting heresy as a tidying up procedure, as making things too tidy. Now sometimes, of course, that is the case, right? And so we would think hyper-Calvinism, hyper for example, tries to be too systematic, consigning some to hell from the get-go, because you have to have that uh, you know, crystal clear logic. If God chooses some, then he has to unchoose others. So I, I, think, I think that that is an insight into some forms of heresy. But of course, there was, there was Gnosticism, which, if anything, wasn't systematic. And the church reacted against Gnosticism, too. So um, thank you very much for that. And I, 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 I think that that does uh, give us a real indication of where the allergic reaction of Dr. Williams might be to um, carefully declared orthodoxy. Um, and for him, I think that the, the, the fear is that we will be over-systematized so that we can't have a fresh response to God. Um, and that's a predispositional allergy, I think, that we do need to recognize and perhaps uh, even pray about because he's not the only one that has that allergy. Um, I, I would like just to push back a little bit on what might have been the perception of some in hearing you talking about his emphasis on sacrament over the word and his ecclesial optimism. Um, and of course you would expect me to do that as one who's, been, um, who's moved in the direction of Eastern Orthodoxy. And I, I guess what I would want to say is I think that the problem is not so much that there is an emphasis um, in uh, Dr. Williams' work on um, sacrament over the word, but there's a forgetfulness that sacrament is not just a mystery, though it is, but sacrament also is accompanied by the word, it's interpreted by the word, right? And so it's the wrong kind of emphasis on sacramental, uh, sac sacramentalism that I think is a problem there. And the same too with ecclesial optimism. I think we have every right to be, um, uh, to be confident that, that God will protect his church. We have it on the highest authority that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. But it's the kind of ecclesial optimism, it's the kind that's taken on, and thank you again for this insight, I'm quite convinced of it, this kind of neo-Hegelianism that things will just take care of themselves if we get, commit ourselves to the promise, or, or to the process. But that's not the way that the church was told to conduct herself. We were to see ourselves as armed for war, as fighting against principalities and powers, not as things taking care of themselves, but actually as having to, uh, having to respond. Um, shall I stop at that point? Or I, I would like to just maybe make, make a quick response to-, to 30 Bishop. seconds. All right, very quickly. Um, thank you very much, Bishop Natsir Ali, for your work. Um, I would like to see this company address itself to the whole question of the sufficiency of scripture and, and what exactly we mean by that. And thank you so much for starting to bring some clarity there. I think that's really essential to the health of those who are looking for the reformation of the Anglican Church and also for discussion of Anglicans with those outside. What, what is meant by what is essential and what is sufficient. I do not think that there is clarity even in the, this gathering about what, it, what those things are. And so until there can be a real lack of fear and a grappling of the, 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 those issues that might divide here. For example, um, um, do scriptures speak about the nature of ordination? Do scriptures speak about the nature of the sacrament? Do scriptures speak um, uh, about, the, about church order? Or here are we also in the area of tradition, and then the, what is the relationship between tradition and scripture? I think until those questions are answered, there's going to continue to be a disease here. And so I, I would just really want to encourage this gathering of those who love the Lord to, to really come to terms with that and to start to talk about what do we mean by the sufficiency of Scripture and what is the real relationship between Scripture and tradition. Uh, one final uh, word. I really think that it's important that we learn, um, those of us who can, to read the Scriptures in their own language. One thing you will discover is that the word tradition is given a very bad rap in many Protestant script, um, uh, translations of the Bible is used only in a negative sense and not in a positive. On the other hand, 
I don't think that God requires those of us who know Greek and, 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 and Hebrew to be the new priests of the church. And I believe the Holy Spirit can talk to someone who does not know the scriptures and can read them only in the vernacular and maybe even in a skewed translation. <laughs> Thank you. Moving to uh, Dr. Noll. Before I get into uh, my remarks, I'd just like to... Uh, um, before I get into my remarks, I, I think I would like to uh, respond to both uh, Edith and um, Kendall and probably qualify it as Kendall would like to be qualified. The whole point of the Reformation is the plowman can read the Bible and that it's accessible to everyone. But those who have the capacity and the gifting to read original languages, they should not be lazy. They should consider it a privilege and an opportunity to uh, dig deeply in God's word. But no one should feel a second class Christian because they don't have that particular capacity. I, am I uh, uh, saying what you're, what you're believing, Kendall? Yes. <laughs> the uh, two, this is working. Are you kidding? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Hello? That was working. Oh. I am circumspect because it's sobering to hear a clear account of the depth of vision, commitment, theological clarity of the current Archbishop of Canterbury. Why is it sobering? He has an ease of presence, a confidence, and the levers of institutional authority to direct the communion as he believes God has called him to lead it. He is a humble man. He has every reason not to be. He is a man of faith. And he deeply believes in the theological vision that he has that God will sort things out. And that gives him an ease and a conviction and an ability to direct. Why is that sobering? Look at us. Bishop Nasrali has begun the discussion of a theological vision for us. Where is our clarity? Where is our unity? Where is our ease of confidence? that the theology we hold will prevail, not because of us, but because of the truth of the theology. Let's be painfully obvious and honest. Where is our conviction that theology matters? Where is our research institutions? Bishop Nazarali, where are the institutions that will produce the next uh, world leader for Anglicanism out of the two-thirds world in theology? Where is the vision encouraging that? What has the Archbishop of Canterbury done? because he has a clear vision and an ease and confidence that what he believes will come to pass, he has a theological education initiative whose whole point is to educate the daughter churches of the missionary movement out of what he considers a defective understanding of Anglicanism where the sufficiency of scripture has been unfortunately been a, a negative yeast. 
and to help them understand that his vision is true Anglicanism and is the way of the future. How are conservatives investing in theological education of the two-thirds world? How much support do we give our theological education institutions in this country? How much sabbatical leave do we permit our theological educators? Do we value them writing textbooks? Or are we dependent on either evangelicals outside our tradition or liberals within our tradition to write the books that our students study? Because those, in, those streams have such institutions. Are we so committed to church planting that we devalue theological reflection and therefore the people who plant the churches have love and scripture, thank God for scripture, but perhaps not an ease of manner of using that scripture to explicate a worldview. I am humbled and sober by our talks because we have articulate opponents in action with institutional authority and the false but still functional unity that comes from an institution. They have structure. And I think we are still so much in mourning for what we have lost including, let us be honest, the perks and positions of responsibility in those institutions that we have yet to come to grips with either the depth of our need or our own fallenness and sinfulness as we have tried to create alternative institutions. It's young, it's new, it's in the beginning. But we should not either underestimate the task or how very, very far we are from even a good beginning. That is a great place to go to questions from, uh, I don't want to say the audience, the congregation. <laughs> And you may address them to any of the panel, uh, panelists or to uh, Dr. Raven or Bishop Nazarelli. It's not coming on. Hello. It is um, This is really in response to uh, 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 Bishop Michael's uh, Tell us who you Just, are. Uh, my name is uh, Chris Hathaway, and uh, I'm studying theology right now to possibly be one of these useful idiots for the future of the church. Um, <laughs> but as, as, as regards to whether Anglicanism can be conciliar or not, um, it strikes me that we have a fatal problem in this area uh, because. I think even among us, we will get into theological fisticuffs if we try to explicate the Nicene Creed when it comes to we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. So how can we come together as a council of the church? What authority do we have to even presume to do that when we are not in agreement as to whether we are the church that could call a council? Um, and it, it seems to me, well, I wonder whether you agree that, that, that maybe the best we can do is to be synodical in that a synod recognizes the need to come together and, and decide things, but that it's not the final word on things, that there are, there are other bodies that we have to coordinate with, even beyond ourselves. And uh, perhaps one of our problems is that we Anglicans have excelled in a certain ecclesiological arrogance in thinking that we are the end all and be all of uh, uh, of Protestantism and of uh, Reformed Catholicism. Thank you, Chris. I gather you, you address that to Bishop Nazarelli? Well, you, you have your own. Yes, 
since I've taken care to equip myself uh, beforehand. <laughs> <laughs> With the possibility of response. Um, I think this is, this is a good question. And I mean, one of the expressions that I have used before is the word synodal, not synodical, which of course has come to mean, certainly in the Church of England, a particular way of gathering that imitates parliamentary forms. But, but synodal, uh, the way of walking together, is certainly an expression uh, that can be used. But uh, uh, two, two points, I mean, one directly to Chris and one related to something that Ashley has just said. I think there is a difference between personal humility and institutional humility. And uh, one of the things that Charles has not addressed is Rowan Williams' view of his own position. Uh, if you wish to see what that is, uh, it is to be found uh, in an address that he gave at the Orthodox uh, Seminary of St. Vladimir's in New York. Uh, and that is to do with his view of, of his own primacy. And uh, if you read it, you will come to the conclusion that even Benedict does not have a view of his own primacy uh, that can be compared. It is a very high view of his own position. Um, and that, uh, you know, that leads to all sorts of other questions about confidence and so on that Ashley was referring to. Um, I think on the conciliarity point, I mean, I, in a way, I don't mind what you call it. I, I'd be happy with a synodal approach. What I think is important is that it must reflect uh, how the church is seen to be gathered and how it consults and decides in the New Testament itself and in the subsequent story of the church. It can't be completely different from that. Um, and of course, we must trust that as the church gathers, uh, the Holy Spirit will lead the church into greater uh, fidelity. Uh, we, you know, not all the answers are, can be prescribed in advance. But the, the point that I was addressing was the deliberate evasion of authentic forms of conciliarity. Thank you. Other comments, questions? Leander. I'm Leander Harding from Trinity School for Ministry. I just, um, uh, I didn't grow up in Anglicanism like a lot of people and came into it from somewhere else. Justification by grace it was the, the water that I found in the desert. So um, I'm deeply grateful for, the, for what the reformers and the English reformers have given us and for that, for that heritage. I'm, I'm struck by the inability of all of the Reformation churches, including the English church, to, um, to steward its patrimony. Uh, I understand that in, that in uh, Germany now, in the heart of the Lutheran Reformation, they, there, are, there are endowed chairs in Lutheran theology that go empty because it just plain aren't any Lutherans to fill those chairs. Um, and, you know, here we are, uh, Anglicanism has, uh, is, is, is suffering this, uh, this uh, uh, crisis of schism. One of the things that I think is precious about all of the Reformation traditions is that they are ref they, that the church must be semper reformanda. You know, the church must be always reforming itself. Is there something in our DNA? Is there something in the original Reformation? Where 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 is where is where is the problem that makes makes it so difficult for us to uh, to maintain our own integrity through time? Can, can I just make one quick uh, factual point to sort of further sharpen that question? Uh, I think sometimes what those outside your community say about you is more significant than what you say to yourselves. And I think it's so significant that the Roman Catholic Church, and more than on one occasion, by the way, with regard to the ordinariate, has said the reason we are setting this up is to preserve the Anglican patrimony. So here you have the Roman Catholic Church saying, we actually think that this is a patrimony that's worth preserving. We can see that you apparently are not able to preserve it and don't seem to have a passion to preserve it. And we would like at least to preserve it. So here is our feeble effort, which needs to be pointed out, is structurally far more creative 
than anything heretofore suggested by the current structures of the communion. It's a real review. All right, the question has been asked and, and uh, sharpened. <laughs> Is there any can, I, can I just now? rephrase and push it back? I, I think that there's something in the patrimony of Anglicanism that should help it to, 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 uh, to, to, um, uh, to keep faithful. Um, and that is that there, there is a, an emphasis upon the responsibility of the laity as well as the clergy, and that's a very good thing. Um, uh, when, when the bishop was uh, speaking to us, um, he talked about what is it that keeps the church faithful, and um, it talked about how reformers point to the deposit of faith, the scriptures, and then put Orthodox and Catholic together in terms of the role of ministry. Actually, I, I don't think that's quite true. I think that um, Orthodox, as, long, uh, as well as Angl uh, Anglicans, have a, um, a they place as, as there should be an emphasis upon the responsibility of the laity to the clergy to keep them honest as well as the clergy to the laity to preserve the deposit of faith you know and, and I think that that's something that has not been taken seriously enough in this crisis I think that the laity have things that they can do on the ground in their own context here's a true story um, uh, in a parish in Alaska, the bishop came for the first time to see his people. This was an Orthodox parish. And he uh, celebrated uh, the Divine Liturgy and gave the sermon and then said to the priest, um, I'd be happy to take questions from the people. So the people started to ask very basic questions. Um, your Grace, Jesus Christ, whose son is he? And Your Grace, what do we do in the Eucharist? And all kinds of very basic questions. And finally, the, pre the, the, the bishop turned to the priest and said, uh, Father, I don't mean any disrespect, but it doesn't seem to me that your people are very acquainted with orthodoxy. And the priest, without missing a beat, snapped back, Oh, no, Your Grace, the people are very acquainted with orthodoxy, but they want to make sure that you are, because if you are not, you cannot be their bishop. That should be part of the DNA of the Anglican Communion, too. No? <laughs> uh, I think it is. Kevin. I hope I don't need any introduction. Um, this would be to uh, uh, Bishop Michael or anybody who wants to respond to it. Uh, I am under the opinion that uh, Anglicanism can no longer be led by Canterbury. Am I wrong? Did everybody hear the question? Yeah. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Just in case you didn't hear the question, uh, can the Anglican communion, well, I don't want to rephrase the way you said it. I can paraphrase it. Uh, is the Anglican communion dependent upon being led by Canterbury? Would that be a, close enough? Is the focus on the office or the current occupant thereof? Or am I allowed to make that distinction? E either or both. Okay. He has been yes, may, may, I don't want to respond to that directly. I, I will in due course. But uh, I think it might be worth commenting first on what has been said by members of the panel. Um, I think on the question of how the laity relate to those who have particular responsibilities, I think this is very important. Um, and of course, the census fidelium uh, must be uh, expressed by the whole church. Um, nevertheless, I think we have to guard against false notions of reception as well, where uh, what is taught in faithfulness um, to revelation is made dependent on the laity. You know, I, I, we can't have that. And I think uh, Rome's resistance to that is correct, uh, because it, that leads to the kind of problems that we find in, in the Anglican communion. Uh, secondly, on the ordinariate, uh, of course, um, the, what, uh, what the apostolic constitution says uh, is, um, only a reporting of what Paul VI said a long time ago when he said that when the Roman Catholic Church is able to embrace its ever beloved sister, ever beloved sister, the Anglican Communion, uh, 
in the full fellowship of the church, nothing of authentic Anglican patrimony should be lost. Uh, so that is what the ordinariate is seeking to foster. However, I think that the way in which the ordinariate has been set up is quite seriously defective in achieving that purpose. For instance, the provisions made for the formation of clergy are seriously defective. Um, and um, I think what will happen very quickly is a Latinizing of the, of the Anglican. Uh, there, are, there are other defects in the, in the canonical way in which the ordinariate has been set up. For instance, I have said it is quite remarkable that the Roman Catholic Church should provide for Anglicans with a Presbyterian polity. You know, the, the polity of the ordinariate is Presbyterian, not Episcopal, yeah. because the ordinary can be, and indeed uh, the, the only one so far appointed, a presbyter, not a bishop. Uh, which is very strange, but, but there you are. So I think there are those difficulties. Um, coming to this question about Canterbury, <clears throat> uh, I, I don't think we ought to begin with Canterbury. I think you know we may end up uh, with, uh, I think, what you are hinting at. But I want to begin with Henry Benn, you know, um, which is how uh, Orthodox Christians and churches uh, develop fellowship and partnership among themselves for the sake of the gospel, for living the gospel, and for proclaiming the gospel. And as that fellowship uh, develops, and as confidence grows, uh, that will in itself indicate um, what the synodality should be like. I mean, uh, um, and we ought to be open to that. Now, as all of this develops, uh, we may come to a view about the place of the Church of England uh, within that, uh, or the place, indeed, of uh, a particular see like that of Canterbury uh, within that. I mean, the, the primacy of Canterbury, even within the Church of England, has not been without controversy. You know, I mean, um, uh, it was strongly challenged in a number of ways uh, within England itself before the Reformation. Uh, and um, it, it, it is not the sort of primacy that the Rome or Constantinople even uh, or any of the, uh, the apostolic sees have claimed for themselves. I mean, it is much more provisional. And of course, as uh, Archbishop Munir was pointing out, Successive Lambeth conferences have said themselves that the kind of Anglican polity that has emerged, uh, Anglicans stand ready for that to disappear in the cause of greater authentic biblical Catholic unity. So all of that has to be kept in mind. Thank you. You're by the five minutes. <laughs> May I respond? Y yes, and then Dr. Ravens, and then we need to head over to worship. Would you like to go first? <laughs> this, this is just a, a lesson from recent history, um, which happens to be drawn from the book that the talk was based on, which is on sale down the corridor. Um, <laughs> but um, the, um, one of the things that I bring out in the book, and this is a point of balance really, um, is the power of the Lambeth bureaucracy. And in terms of leadership from England, uh, it may not make a great deal of difference if there was a different person um, uh, 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 um, as Archbishop. And how I think we see this is that immediately, well, within three weeks of the um, 1998 conference, when um, Archbishop George Carey made a very courageous stand, he was over here at Greenwich, North Carolina, I think. Um, 50 members of integrity turned up to the service, and in his uh, sermon there, and it's documented in the book, um, he said to Louis Crewe and company, that you may be angels unaware, that we need to listen to you, um, which effectively undermined um, the, the intention of Resolution 110, and paved the way then for um, Rowan's um, Indaba dialogue, conversational 
process. Um, and I was actually on the receiving end, not directly from George Carey, but from the Bishop of Lambeth at exactly the same time. And I was told that if I couldn't recognize the authority of my diocesan bishop, who was a, um, a leading uh, gay rights advocate within the Church of England, I should resign, I should my curate. And he was speaking, at least with the formal authority, of the Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, I didn't resign. Um, but you know, th I think this, th these are facts that we, need, we do, do, do need to be aware of in terms of the way that um, the institutions run in England. Thank you. Dr. Noel. If Bishop Nazarelli would like to go to Henry Venn, surprise, surprise, I'd like to go to Thomas Cranmer. <laughs> <laughs> I think the question is misframed. It's a typical Anglican desire to find an institutional response, to find institutional unity. If we don't like the institution we have, we need to create another institution as the source of unity. I have a great deal of respect for Thomas Cranmer's theology, but I think we have to recognize as part for Leander Harding's question of DNA. What is the original Anglican understanding of the relationship between the church and society. But Cranmer is not like Knox, and it's not like the Roman church, that the church is separate from society. The institutional, he makes the good distinction between the visible and the invisible, and the institutional church is, a, a, is an expression of society. That's why the head of society can be head of the institutional church. And as a result, throughout the history of the, of the communion, uh, the, an overriding burden of the church is to justify its role in society. And therefore, as society changes, so does the theology of Anglicanism. 16th century Anglicanism is clearly reformed. 17th century Anglicanism is a reaction against that because of the leadership, and it is uh, best characterized by the Caroline Divides. 18th century Anglicanism, surprise, surprise, is characterized by the Enlightenment. Then something different happens in the 19th century, where we have vibrant expressions of each of the three previous centuries' understandings of Anglicanism. We have Anglo Catholicism, we have a broad churchmanship, and we have evangelicalism. How do they all survive in the Church of England when they have very different theological presuppositions? We come to an agreement that Cramner's liturgy unites us in repentance. And why is repentance good? Because it teaches, guess what? Morality to the people. And that's the function of the church, is to implicate morality in society. And we don't care which theology you use, because each, in a different way, encourages repentance. And repentance, in turn, encourages people to be good, decent, moral Victorians. And since I'm the moderator, I have the last word. Oh, I'm... oh you're not finished. Oh, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just, I'm just... <laughs> The question is, does the Anglican Communion have to be led by Canterbury? And I go back to Charles Simeon that when he died, it was reported that he was more influential than any primate in all of England, and he was but a parish priest. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. <laughs>